please help me welcome Mary Dusenbury. Thank you, Annie. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, this is the second time I've seen, actually, this is the third time I've seen the decorated screens. Um, Rachel Nabecker got hold of me a number of years ago, and I think it was the first exhibition uh, from here. And then earlier this, well, last year, uh, she contacted me again and said it was fun to be as an exhibition of them. Um, so I came out maybe a month ago or so and uh, to see them. And um, at that point, Andy invited me to talk a little bit about some of the work I've done in Central Asia. Um, and it was a real pleasure getting ready for this because most of what I was doing on three trips to Central Asia, born in 2002 to Xinjiang in Northwest China, where with a group of um, European, Japanese, North American, and Chinese textile curators and conservators, we were looking at newly excavated textiles from the tombs in Xinjiang that some of you may have read about. And then um, in 2007, I went into Central Asia from Turkey, and then in 2008, went from Xinjiang overland back into uh, Uzbekistan. Um, but except for the archaeological trip, most of my work had been focusing on the ikat weaving from Central Asia, the silk, production of silk and of ikat textiles, which are textiles in which the world threads and or the west threads, but in Central Asia, usually the warm threads are bound off in sections before they're dyed to make the pattern after they're woven. So it's a bit tricky. You have to keep every single thread of those hundreds and hundreds of little silk threads in order. But this time I wanted to focus on some other things that we also saw, um, particularly cells and the way uh, textiles are used in yurts. So I went back over the thousands of images I had, um, ones I had not edited for other talks, other places, looking at things I hadn't shown before. And that was a treat. I remembered things and I remembered people, but I kind of slipped out of my mind. So that's what I want to talk about today. <laughs> um, I think my interest in Central Asia and Silk Road things started in the early 1970s when I was living in Kyoto, Japan for a number of years. Um, and I was a student at the Kyoto University of Arts, Kyoto Gijutsu Daigaku, um, thanks to a grant from the Japanese Ministry of Education, which opened all kinds of doors for me. Um, and I was in the textile studio, but I also took lecture classes and found out about this amazing 8th century imperial collection of treasures um, from Japan, Korea, China, and even further afield. Um, Fault the Show Zoin, which some of you may have heard of. Um, and they have, since World War II, it used to be a closed imperial collection. But um, since World War II, they started exhibiting them once a year to the general public for two weeks. And I started going to those exhibitions and was fascinated by, of course, these thousands of objects, many textiles. And as I said, some were made in Japan, often under the tutelage of a Korean or Chinese um, craftsperson. Others came from Korea or China, and some came from as far away as Persia. And some were made kind of um, under the influence of textiles and other objects that had come from um, places much further afield. Um, these textiles, I mean, all of this collection was made um, in honor of the eye-opening ceremony of the great Buddha at Todaiji 
which was the Imperial National um, Temple in Nara. And also a few years later in 1756, the personal collection of Ezra Shomu, who had been behind a lot of this effort. So that's where my interest really started. And since then, I really wanted to explore the Silk Road and just sort of keep going. Um, but it was many years before I was able to do it as the um, first trip in 2002, as far as Xinjiang. Um, if I can manage to be uh, miles from here. Um, as you can see, this is the core of the Silk Road, which really should be called Silk Roads because there were so many of them. Um, and they don't show here. Let's see, Let's see the mouse. No. We'll do it the old fashioned way. Um, the, they went on through here to Japan and Korea, up from here to Korea, up from here through the passes to Korea, things from Manchuria came down. And of course, everything came down to India, went up through what was later called Russia. And there were many, many sea routes as well, which, of course, weren't as well documented. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you, David. Wonderful. And this is a little uh, more detailed map. Um, and you can see. can see from here uh, how steep the terrain is. The yeah, this isn't working. Oh, there we go. Um, this is all desert, the top of the Khan Desert, which was really fearsome. There is a place called Dewan here as you come into the desert. Oh, excuse me, here. Um, Buddhist cave temple, some of you probably heard of. And people stop there on the way out to pray and make offerings. Uh, and they stopped on the way back if they were fortunate enough to have made it through the desert to give thanks for surviving this really uh, difficult desert. And then, um, just not very good at tennis, so. Uh, and then you can see that it's secured with mountains, the Himalayas down here. Uh, the Chin Shan here, um, here, and then we, on the second trip, traveled from Burunchi uh, here, flew down to Hotan here, and as you can see, the towns are all skirt the desert. And then overland to Kashgar, very all trading city, right where the two branches come together, through the Torgut Pass into Kyrgyzstan, which is in here, down to Osh at the base of the Fregana Valley. And um, we stayed there the first time. The, sec the first trip we went, uh, we came in and traveled all over. Um, Uzbekistan, Samarkand, Bukhara, and down to the Afghan border and into Fergana. But this time we were a little bit more focused um, in the Fergana Valley, which is the main place that the Ikat textiles are made today. So here we are in Hotan, which is somewhat of a dreary city, very bustling, um, big markets. And Hotan has been known for as long as anyone can remember for wonderful jade. And even in the Han Dynasty, two, three thousand years ago, um, no, excuse me, two thousand or even two thousand five hundred years ago, um, people from the center of China and the capitals of China would send to Hotan for jade. Uh, it comes down from the mountains. Um, 
Today, if you go through the Hutan River and some other dry river beds, you see bulldozers excavating jade. They pay a big price for the privilege, but everybody is free if they do, if they only use hand to, tools to collect jade on their own. And many people do do that. We were looking at many different craftspeople in and around Hopton, uh, paper maker, felt makers, weavers, um, somebody who pressed oil by hand, um, and I'll show you just a few of those. These are felt making couple, the Miraxine family in the little town of Aksarai. Um, talk more about felt making in Kyrgyzstan, um, which is done a little bit differently uh, and more like the ones that are in the exhibition in there. Um, we spent several hours with this family. <clears throat> They're putting, um, there's a lot of work that goes into the felt making before any of the felt making stars. The fleece needs to be sorted and washed um, and separated and then fluffed up and fluffed up and fluffed up. Um, and then here the pattern is laid down and then the hooking the fleece put, the uncolored fleece put on top and then it's felted, which is usually an extremely long, tedious, and physically demanding process where it's rolled into a bundle, wetted, and rolled back and forth and back and forth for hours and hours, maybe a day, day and a half. Well, this family was very ingenious, and they had figured out how, and they had built themselves a felt beating machine. And they also had figured out and built a carding machine so that instead of pulling the fleece apart, for hours and hours and hours by hand, they had a carding machine that did that. And they also had this beater, which I tried to photograph, but it was too dark in the little tiny room, um, that just sort of goes round and round and round. And there's several bell rugs together and they bump into each other as, as it turns. Um, so it used to be in this little village that everybody made their own felts. And now a number of families still do that, but most families bring the fleece from their own sheep to the family, and then they wash and dye and do the patterns. When we asked about the patterns, and the grandfather said, oh, they're all in my stomach. <laughs> they had a starling little boy who for two or three hours just ran around trying to help never jumped on the rug, never had to be told, don't touch that, just um, did little things like seeing if he could move the bundle of wool all by himself, which he couldn't. <laughs> and then uh, in another little town, we visited one of several mother-son operations, um, weaving, selling me cotton. Uh, the system there uh, that they were part of um, was that they were sent, they were brought uh, pre-tied and dyed um, ikat or from a factory, government factory, and then they would weave it. Um, as you can see, straightening every single thread. Threads tend to break, so correcting each thread as they go along. Uh, and then they would bring it back and be paid for the work. But they didn't have to buy the materials themselves. They didn't do the time or the dying themselves. We actually saw several mother-son operations in Xinjiang. And I must say, Xinjiang was really painful to travel in. What's happening to the Uyghur population there is just brings up tears to my eyes every time I think about the people I met. Um, in these mother-son things, it's just the father had been taken away. And in fact, we were supposed to have a guide who knew all of the craftsmen and artists in the area. And right before we got there, he phoned 
um, somebody in his little um, tour company in Beijing and said, um, I'm not going to be able to be guy. He'd been in a protest and um, was going to be taken away. And he said, but I can call again and I'll give you the name of all my contacts so somebody else and how to reach them. Um, you know, no street addresses. Um, so somebody else can do it. And then by the next day, his phone was dead and nobody heard from him again. So we had quite a time finding people because the new guy that we had, the driver we had, didn't know any of these people, didn't know where they were. We would stop and ask, and then they'd send us to somebody else. And we, um, both trips to Central Asia, I had organized with a couple of colleagues along to, you know, some of y'all share the research. But with the proviso, this is not a tour. We're going, we're building lots of time into the schedule. So if we meet, Somebody find out it's going to be one day. We can go the next day um, and go meet them. And you know, we just had a few stops along the way where we had to be somewhere at a certain time. But most of it, we were very flexible, which turned out to be fortunate. The towns, as I mentioned before, are all around the edge of the Taklamakan Desert in the oases, and the oases are fed sometimes underground from the mountains, water from the mountains, but right on the edge of the cities is desert. And here I am standing a little behind um, these two men on the motorcycle and behind the air houses with little gardens and trees. And um, if you walk out sort of out to here, all of a sudden the trees stop and this is what you have. Um, there were tombs in the desert. People seemed to use the desert to bury people. Um, I'm not showing it here, but there's a, a small mosque just further than this little one um, into the desert that was a very famous 10th century person who had died in an insurrection there. Uh, but I was really surprised, whoops, wrong direction, uh, to find this Tibetan style tomb there. Um, and I had known that the Tibetans had control of that area, but that was a thousand years ago, or 1200 years ago, and it's still, um, we didn't see things like this very often, but there was this very well kept tin, um, Tibetan style tomb in the desert there outside Bhutan. Well, the desert was very beautiful in places, very desolate in places. And I think if you really got into it by yourself, it would be very, very scary. As travelers' journals um, you know, talked about, especially certain parts of it, you were just past dry bones of animals and people along the way. Um, it's it's a fearsome desert. Here we are on the way between Otan driving to Kashgar, that trading city where the two branches of the Silk Road come together near the base of the Jianshan Mountains. Um, I looked up in Google the other day how long it takes, and now apparently it, the drive is five and a half hours. The road must be a lot better because it was really bad when we went and it took us 10 hours. <laughs> so it was a very long drive through the desert. But we saw a crew break at one little town. And my notes, I don't know if I ever knew what the name of the town was, but it was sort of a one street little town, donkey carts everywhere, as they are even in Bhutan. Um, and this shop was really lovely. He got right there in the middle of the desert. More desert. Oh, um, on our 10 hours to Kota, to Kashgar. And then uh, the market in Kashgar. And I didn't just start in case I haven't said it enough times already. 
If Kashgar is here where the two branches of the Silk Road come together, you go to the northern part or you go to the south through Lotan. Um, and it's the, at the base of the passes into the main part of Central Asia. Um, at the top left is the covered market in Kashgar. It's been an important trading city for, you know, probably longer than anybody knows. Um, that building itself is fairly new. When I was there in 2002, it was a different older building. So they rebuilt the market, but with the same merchants. And on the right, uh, you see a merchant with a very popular um, shop with Russian shawls at the top, and then uh, most of the Ika, Silk Ika and Yask are from Bhutan. And then he told us from a tiny town about three hours north of Kashgar called Opal, and one mother's son, uh, we were there. Um, so we asked him about that. We thought that would be an interesting person to go see. Um, see if they were doing different sorts of work than we had seen in Hontan. And he said, we'll come back when it isn't quite so busy and I'll, I'll tell you. Meanwhile, when we got back, he tried to call, but they apparently hadn't paid their phone bills, so there was no phone. So he said, well, it's somewhere in Opal. So this was a lucky that we had all day because it took quite a few hours to actually find the family, but we did and um, talk with them to And then, oh, the animal, I love the animal market at Kashgar. Um, inside, in the product part, uh, there's, I showed you the silk ingot, but there's also all kinds of things that come from the mountains. There's these wonderful fur hats and coats, and um, so there's furs and belts and silk, and, uh, and then, of course, everything you might need, like so and uh, handmade tools and handmade animal artists. Um, when I first flew in, uh, when I first went to Kashgar, I flew in from Uruchi to Kashgar in 2002, and the plane was full of Russian businessmen coming in for the day to the Sunday market at Kashgar. Uh, but the animal market is really important to yaks, um, horses, goats, sheep, donkeys, handmade um, belts, handmade animal trappings. And then uh, on to Kyrgyzstan, uh, this is the road through the Toragut Pass. Um, the topography in Kyrgyzstan is pretty impressive. And as we came down the other side, uh, people were bringing their herds to summer pasture. Um, and these people are bringing yaks, and uh, including this little newborn baby that one of the riders had to go back for because it needed to stop and take a nap. <laughs> and then we went all to the valley of Tashwabak, uh, which is a summer camp for two, <coughs> two herding families. And they had permission um, to uh, to graze their sheep in in this valley. And um, you can see there's no fences. Uh, so that once or twice a day, one of the men uh, from one of the herding families would go up and kind of separate the two herds so they didn't get mixed up. And this little boy was practicing herding. And the goat didn't want to be herded away from the herder, but he was driving his way to go, and they were sort of having to stand on. Um, we stayed there for, I think, probably three days. Um, and the, the, it was so dark inside the yurt that we stayed in that um, the slides, I'm afraid, aren't very really good. But I wanted to show you the inside of our working yurt that was used 
all the time. This family, um, the father um, over on your right um, is a school teacher. He, they teach in, he teaches in the valley during the winter. And then in the summer, they bring their er birds. Uh, his, their daughter is in medical school. Their sons come and help them in the summer um, with herding the sheep. And this was, this is us at dinner. Our driver and our guide, Frida Sorber, who is textile curator in Minneapolis. Well, well um, Frida Sorber over there, who is textile curator in Belgium. Lotus Stack, Minneapolis. Yael Rosenberg, who is a textile curator in the Metropolitan. And um, I'm not there in the middle because I'm taking a picture. Um, nice, nice dinner. And you can see how there's just layer and layer and layer of textiles and patterns. There's commercial coverlets, handmade cells, uh, the wicker work that is the support structure for the yurt, and a decorated screen, reed screen um, behind. Frankly, I had forgotten that I had even seen one in the yurts um, until I looked back over those old slides. And this is a detail of it. <laughs> and another shot of just the absolute layering um, things. Um, the wicker work is very useful. You can hang whatever you like from it. You can stick something through it, a scarf through it, and hang it, or you can put up a picture for a little while that you'd like to have there. Um, it was quite cold. Um, there was a stove in the middle, and they were in Yakdome. And I'd always been curious, because of course, you know, the pioneers here burned down also. And I'd always wondered if it didn't smell a bit. And it doesn't. They, um, during the day, they collect every bit of sheep um, dung around, and the people who have the axe collect the axe dung. And they mix it with straw and dry it in the sun. And when they burn it, it's completely odorless, which is nice. Um, on our way to Bishkek in the north, or capital city in the north, we stopped at a little museum and craft shop. And the young woman running the craft shop was demonstrating various of the old craft traditions of Kyrgyzstan including making that decorating screen. And she's not very good at it, actually. And the uh, information you have in the exhibition it, um, shows things a lot more clearly than this does. But it was nice to see that various people are really making an effort to preserve this. And this was an exhibition, I'm sort of jumping out in time order here, but down near Osh, near the Fugata, that valley, there's a museum um, that had a lot of traditional arts and crafts, including a really lovely exhibition of decorated screens. And then this is a place I want to spend a minute or two talking about. Um, this is a town called Abashi, and the woman we're looking at is generally. Uh, the cola, the, my pronunciation is terrible, but um, she is a master belt maker known all over Kyrgyzstan. Uh, some of her work is in the British Museum. She was invited when she was a little bit younger, she's 85 at this point. She was um, invited to demonstrate in Sweden, um, and she really does everything the old way and makes some of the most beautiful bells I have really ever seen. Um, I want to show you just a few pictures of the belt making process. And you know, everything I was showing was actually something that would take one or two hours or four or five or six hours. Um, the not showing you collecting the fleece, washing the fleece, the preliminary sorting of the fleece but then cleaning off all the bad ends and then hours of beating it. Um, they told us that 
a really good fleece um, can be beaten in about three hours with two people working very fast. And a bad fleece might take 10, 10 hours. So the quality of the original fleece makes a huge difference. And then laying it out very, very carefully on one of these green mats. And then um, we didn't see the next part of the process, but this is the backing felt for the type of felt they make. And it would be felted by um, putting hot water on it. And then instead of having a beating machine or rolling it all day by hand, they stick it behind a horse and gallop the horse for about an hour and a half and bring it back and put more hot water on it and then take off on the horse again. <laughs> um, so that's how they manage to do that. They said it has to be done in the summer on hot, sunny days. And then their method of making belts, um, and you have several lovely examples in there, um, takes a lot longer than a method that we saw in uh, St. John, which is much more typical of the way the dolls are usually made. Um, they take two squares of belt of two different colors. I'm not sure if you can see there's a light blue and a dark blue, and there's a red and a gray. And they use heavy paper, cut out a pattern, and mark it with, if she's marking it with a piece of soap, and then she's sharpening her knife. And I put that in because we often don't think of all of the bits of the process that don't seem particularly interesting as part of the process, but are absolutely essential to getting a good product in the end. Um, I knew of a Japanese stencil cutter that the paper stencils for um, printed fabrics that would spend a 10 hour day by himself without being disturbed sharpening his tools and preparing himself to start cutting the stencil the next day. So that is something that we don't usually, we're not usually aware of, but that is a really important part of the process and how fine the product is in the end. And then this is what they look like. They take the bottom and jigsaw it into the top and the top and jigsaw it into the bottom. So the cells are made in pairs. And um, so there'll be a, a bell with dark on light and one with light on dark. And these are then put onto the base that I showed you earlier, the dark fabric and um, belted uh, together and stitched together. Again, this is something you wouldn't really particularly think of, but the quality of the thread is really important too. And I didn't see this being done, but I read that the thread is usually hand spun. And then over on the right, uh, she is, Jumbe is uh, sort of twisting it together and here she's adding a sharper twist to make a board that then on the left, the, um, so with the cord, the dark and the light together. And then this is a, a detail of a finished belt. And you can see that there's, well, there's edging that I'm not showing you. There's the two pieces corded together uh, in various ways. And then there's the quilting that was the top decorative felt through to the bottom. And that part of the process is usually done in the winter when they can't um, make the felt itself. And here she is with some of her um, summer her rugs. You have one a little bit like this in the exhibition. Um, and then if you look carefully up here, some of the felts I like the most are done um, by separating out the colors of the fleece so that 
the white is very, very white, and the gray is just pure gray, and then there's a dark brown or a dark black. And that's a lot of separating out these. Of course, there are sheep that are browner and sheep that are grayer and sheep that are whiter, but even so, you need to do quite a lot of sorting to get as pure colors as that. And I, I, those are some of the ones I, I really love the most. And if you look carefully, you can see that in the back there, there are heirs. This is the family. Um, some members of her family now help her, and there are several uh, neighbors that have joined in and become apprentices too. So I think that this will probably continue um, after she's no longer able to do very much. Oh, well, I, I should, I might say um, that I volunteer whenever I can at the International Folk Art Market in Santa Fe, which I would expect many of you know about. Um, and the felt makers from, there are always felt makers from Kyrgyzstan that come. And there are some young felt makers who have graduated from an art school in Bishkek who are using felt. And they're using it in very innovative, imaginative ways. They're making clouds where the pattern is the difference between thick felt and thin felt. So a great deal of skill. I don't know how they do that. Um, and that's a very beautiful work. So I think we'll see felt from Kyrgyzstan for a long time. Um, just a few more things to tell you. We went on to Bishkek, and I put my camera in my pocket. Um, I kind of wish I hadn't, but I did. We needed a lot more time in Bishkek than we had, um, but we were mostly talking to people. And one of them was Bibira at Moldova, who is the person who helped Jan, John Summer make this collection. Um, and she, John Summer had introduced us by email, very kindly. Um, and we had lunch with her um, in a lovely little outside cafe. And she was so pleased to hear that the screens were here, that I had seen them, that they were beautifully cared for, um, beautifully kept, and that the cop went and shown, let them go to other museums. So more people had been able to see them. And it was really, you know, sort of heartfelt joy for her to know what had happened to them. And then uh, we talked to Irina Lovislav-Solkaya from an organization called CAXA, which is Central Asian um, Craft Support Agency, I think that's right, or association. And that is a Central Asia-wide association um, that tries to help preserve and help local craftsmen um, find markets, find materials, find students um, to keep the crafts alive and thriving and um, at their highest quality. And then on down the mountains from Bishkek down to Osh at the edge of the Fergana Valley. And uh, we went through three mountain passes on the way. We were on a main highway, which we shared with semi-trucks and flock after flock of animals going to summer pasture. I mean, you can see that this is the place to get through. I mean, they couldn't take them to the side of the road exactly. There's nowhere to go. So um, lots of sheep and goats. Um, the yaks must already have been in summer pasture because we didn't see any of them um, after the first day. Um, horses, cattle, long tunnels in which narrow tunnels in which semis and cars and our little van and sheep and goats and horses all had to take their turn. This is sort of irrelevant, but we stopped along the way. Um, this, you know, as I asked if we could stop here, uh, water has been important and sacred in so many societies and in so many different religious traditions. This was a spring that 
for some reason was considered savory. While we were there, a truck driver stopped to get some cool, fresh water and to gray. And other people stopped too. And you could see that all around there were uh, cloth, prayer cloths hanging from the trees. Then Osh, this is not Osh, um, I should have had a blind side in there. Uh, Osh, which had just celebrated its 3,000th anniversary as a city when we got there in 2007. And that's a long time. That's old little Rome. Um, and then, of course, on the Silk Road to the famous cities of Samarkand, this is Samarkand and Bukhara. But on that trip, as I said, we didn't go on that way. Um, instead, we stayed in the Fergana Valley, and we stayed with uh, this man in the middle and his family, Vasudin Dajanov. That he's an ikat, silk ikat weaver that um, we had met the year before. And um, he helped to introduce us to all kinds of people all through the valley. And we looked very, very carefully and for a long time at uh, the silver making process and the ikat making process from the worms, which are grown in little tiny farming nozzles uh, to ikat. Um, that's a story for another time. And so in this last slide, I just wanted to say that at least at that time, and I think probably in many places still, this beautiful silk ikat is really beloved. On the left is a young woman and her son in Xinjiang. And on the right is a very similar, I mean, the pattern's a little different, but the coloring and the type of pattern uh, is also an ikat from Central Asia, but uh, designed by Ralph Lauren for Willing Days. <laughs> so thank you. We have a little time for questions. If anyone has uh, questions for Mary, oh, what an adventure! Thank you. Uh, we, uh, I would like to hear a little more about the, the process of making the e class. Um, we have been only in Bukhara, who's back in stand one purchased a number of pieces. But could you tell us more just how they do that? We just look so um exact in many ways, but still I don't I don't mm -hmm. it's still exuberant. Yes, yes, yeah. Um so we uh, yes. Um, that's another 45 minutes. Right, but uh, briefly, um, the way they do it in Uzbekistan, um, the warp threads and, and the pattern, Ika can be done in the warp in the vertical way or in the weft. And in Uzbekistan, Central Asia, they do it just in the warp. Some places do it both. Some places just do it in weft, but in, in Central Asia, it's more being done. So the threads are uh, spread out uh, as if it were a huge warping board. Does that make sense to you? Uh, okay. Uh, from about here to maybe over here. Uh, there's a board with nails or something on the edge, and it's wound back and forth along there. So two boards, a board here and a board and a board and a board down there and then yeah, back, like a frame. Yeah, but under tension. Mm -hmm. So then uh, they go along and uh, the best the best craftsmen have the designs in their head. And now there are some young craftsmen who make up the design. Or there are designers who make the design and give it, uh, like on brass paper. Uh, and then they 
tie off in bundles the part they don't want to go in the dye. So imagine that um, it's going to be, what color do you like? Say a color. Well, blue. Okay. That's what I was going to say. Uh, blue and white. Uh, the, so they wrap all the white areas. And then uh, it goes into the indigo bat or into a synthetic blue bat. And then comes out and gets dried and then untied. So the places that have been tied are white and the places that were are blue. And if it's many colors, you have to repeat the process. And if you had yellow, for example, you dye it, you tie everything but the yellow, dye it, and then you would tie the yellow yeah. after it dried. Good see? Yeah. And then how they get it on the little is another thing. But that is basically, I mean, the rest of it is just good still weaving. Yeah. Thank you. Does that help? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Other questions? And and I have a question about has this e cut come from the designs or the method owned or the invented or the area where no, the word e cut uh, has come into general use for that technique. Actually is um from one of the languages in Indonesia. In Indonesia, it means, but in Indonesian, when I was in school in um, Kyoto, I asked an Indonesian friend about Ika, and he was so puzzled because it means a headscarf, actually. But it got picked up. You know, in, in English, we often pick up a term from another language and we use it wrong. Well, that's what happened with Ika. So it means the technique. There's no, there's no other general term for it. Ika is the technique, but you can have, so you can have Ika only from Japan or Ika weaving from the Korean. Yes, and each country has its own terminology. Um, and in Uzbekistan, they have a different word for Ika that is made of silk and cotton which some Muslims insist on wearing because they don't want silk next to their bodies. Um, and some that is also. So there's really no no one term that everybody all over. So we just sort of use ecot that way. That's a really good question. Other questions? Can you say something about the dyes that are used, um, the sorts of dyes, soils, plants, insects? I know there's a predominance of reds. Uh, that's because the red is just so much. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, but till fairly recently, it was mostly synthetic dyes, chemical dyes. But because Europeans and Japanese really like Plant-based dyes. Um, they've started using some, but a lot of people actually they say this is naturally dyed. It's actually synthetic dyed, and they throw sort of little few plant leaves in on top, so they say it's naturally dyed. Uh, most of it is synthetically dyed. What was the original source of dyes? What do you know? Um, Indigo. No, plants, low plants, and I don't know. A lot of places use uh, black or other bugs, and I'm not sure in Central Asia what was used. I expect that in the 19th century, they probably used cochineal, uh, which originally came from Mexico. What is that? It's a bug. Oh. Uh, and, and it's a wonderful, wonderful red. And it makes a, a variety of shades of reds and purples, and it's a very, very color pass. So as soon as it was commercially available, people were not all over the world used it. Um, but I don't think enough has been analyzed to really say. There's a lot of, uh, that's another really good question. Um, there's a lot of research that still needs to be done. And it's very difficult talking to people because they want to 
they want to sell their work and they want to tell you what they think you want to hear. So it's very difficult to find people who will say, well, really, actually, my grandfather used synthetic dyes. Um, but his father, we think, is, you know, such an or something. So it's a good question. Are there people in that area doing research? Um, I'm thinking of you coming from a Western society into that society doing their research. And are there the native folks there doing that because they're going to be able to? I know of several people in Kyrgyzstan that are um, some Kyrgyzstan people. Um, who are doing really good ethnographic research on Kyrgyzstan and nomadic things. Um, and um, Irina is one of those. She was about, she was finishing a book on horse culture when we were there. Um, I don't know of that, or at least that is done. Um, and it wasn't because we didn't want to try try to find out, um, but we didn't succeed in finding out. You want to just talk really loudly, Chuck? Did you back? Um, what was the end of? More like that one question of, of color. I mean, just looking at your piece recently on like the color of the year in Pantone and you know, evolution of color now, and you were commenting that until fairly recently, color was just the wealthy, at least, at least in Europe, because dyes were expensive. And so most people wore various grades. Would that also have been true here if you went back a thousand years? I'm sure it would color have been so rare. Yes. Um, yes, indeed. And of course, when we're talking about Silica, um, most people in Central Asia can't afford Silica. And one of the things that really interested me was where all of that he got was coming from. And in 2007, when we were there, we asked all kinds of people in the markets, and nobody knew. They said, oh, we think probably it comes from Russia. Um, but this last trip, we kind of, it was a question that came to our mind near the end of the 2007 trip. And then in 2008, we decided that was one thing we wanted to pursue a little bit more. Um, there's a process of printing on the war. So it's not like, it looks quite different than printing on the finished textile, um, but it is quite different than hand ties. And of course, most people can't afford silk. So there's polyester and there's various other kinds of synthetics. And it turns out most of them come from a factory near Hangzhou in China, but the best come um, from factories near Seoul in Korea and um, are made for the Uzbek market. But uh, going back to your question about color, yes, that's perfectly true. That it was, um, that certainly anything you'd have to purchase. I mean, if you could go out and collect something, um, fine, but the very best dyes uh, were beyond the reach of one speed walking. Was that true in Japan too? Mm -hmm. For indigo? No, indigo quite early on became quite accessible. So that, that indigo was believed um, now, no reason to think this isn't true, to strengthen the fabric. So there were practical reasons for using indigo. And also, in Japan, uh, indigo was believed to keep snakes away, the poisonous snakes. When you were wading through water in rice fields, replanting rice, that if you were wearing indigo, it would repel the snakes. Well, it has a strong enough smell that, that that could really be true. So no, I mean, even in the 10th century, when you look at some of those wonderful pictures from the 10th, 11th, 12th century, um, you don't see very much color, uh, but you see a little bit of indigo. And of course, the um, 
the imperial family and the aristocracy were wearing all these marvelous, absolutely marvelous colors. But other people were wearing uh, national colors and into them. What's your question? Do you have your own collection that um, fabrics in and what type of things do you have in there? Um, I have one piece that I really don't like, <laughs> and I have a lot of it. And the reason I have it is because we were in a market in the Fermata Valley in Antijon, and I had heard that there was a war wrapping machine, and I knew that in Japan, in Japan in the early 20th century, trying to compete with new industries, people that were doing handcrafts developed the most marvelous um, engineered techniques for speeding up parts of the process. And of course, time and untime, which can take as long as time, um, was one of the slowest processes. So I had read about these um, tying machines in the early 20th century in Japan. And we heard that there was one that some places used them in in Uzbekistan. And so in the market once, you know, we just kept asking around, asking around. And uh, one merchant said, yeah, I know one. And it took two hours for him to negotiate with other people that we could go see her. And one of the reasons it took so long was because the company was, well, uh, the family was operating under the radar. They weren't paying taxes. And so when we got there, we, we said, please don't ask our name. Please don't photograph anything that has our name on it. Uh, da, 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 da. So as a thank you <laughs> to the man who arranged all this for us, I bought quite a lot of a dreary brand. <laughs> Just yesterday, I was wondering what I'm going to do with that. <laughs> yeah. I had one of Jangale's um, belt rugs and, um, you know, bits that he got different places instead we visit you know, his bag of stuff. Any other questions? I have one. Uh, what was it like staying in a yurt? So you stayed with um, families that lived there, then did a yurt, and then also at the soap making area. Yeah. What was that like? Um, so the year it was the year it was lovely. I mean it was just it was so nice staying there just enveloped in textiles and powder and powders that we say that doesn't go together at all, you know. But, um, you know, it, that was lovely. It was a lovely family. Actually, in fact, Andy, um, when we got there, we settled in with this family and then the other family, which was, you didn't see, it was further down the valley, um, they came storming up and said, no, 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 the reservation is with us. <laughs> so we got moved down there and took a look around and they had set it up for tourists. It wasn't, you know, one they used themselves. It didn't have, didn't have the strays. It didn't have the cells. Blah, blah, blah. So, uh, but meanwhile, our guy tried to pull the main office. Well, it was no cell phone service, of course. So they said, we'll be back. And three hours later, they got back. They had to drive an hour and a half to get cell phone service. <laughs> and then uh, they came back, and I've forgotten what they determined. But we said, uh, no, we're going back to the first place. If we have to pay these people off, we'll pay them off. But we're going back. But it was lovely. Klaus lived in, and uh, he'd done very well as an ECOT leader. He's well known and so well. Um, he's been to the folk art market. Um, and he had built this very big house around the central corner and was um, set up to take care. But he didn't really know how to do it. So the one room 
One time when we get dressed in the morning, one of the sons came charging in without knocking to get something out of his closet. And um, I mean, it was fine, but it was not as comfortable or pleasant as the, the family just didn't know how to be a suitable, didn't know how to have guests. But anyway, I'd do, I'd do it again. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you for answering your question. But obviously, uh, thank you very much for being here today. And uh, we're ready to go. If you have questions before you leave, I'm sure Mary would entertain those. And uh, thank you very much for coming today. And we'll see you again.